You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. It is Monday. That means it is Mental Health Monday, and we'll check in with Deaconess Heidi in just a moment. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin, for your support of The Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. Good morning, Heidi. It's time for Mental Health Monday. You ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. We're going to talk benefits. I feel like that's nice to move from boundaries to benefits this week. <laughs> <laughs> of social media. Yes. yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's good. I, fine. <laughs> I, I almost said you're listening to social media instead of coffee hour because oh, I had the notes in my head this morning. So, right. But I don't think we're really listening to social media. Do it we is. count Do we count as social media? I don't know. No. We're not social? We have social media, but we are not social media. Yes, but we're social and we're a form of media. So, But people don't interact. We're going to debate this the entire time. No. Um, so what are... <laughs> Moving on. What are some, <laughs> now that we've we've picked apart uh, even just a little bit, some of the challenges of social media and establishing boundaries. And again, I guess we should revisit our disclaimer. Mm-hmm. We are not, we're, we're not promoting or any particular platform of social media. We're not saying you should use social media. Mm-hmm. We're not saying you shouldn't use social media either. Today, we're just weighing in on perhaps the, the benefits of social media use. So... Heidi, what do you see as some of the general benefits in the use of social media? I would like to use the words past, present, and future to um, right. align this conversation here. I think the the main benefit of social media is connection. Like that's the point and the purpose mm-hmm. for some people. <laughs> for some companies, it's also monetization, and so that's we talk about that in boundaries. I think, um, but overall, even in the monetization of social media. It is about connection, right? That's why any of us use it. And so it connects us to our past, right? We There is a dailiness that is offered with social media in relationships from our past that we wouldn't have otherwise. It's just there's too many relationships to keep track of that a lot of times, and our world is super mobile. So a lot of us move around to some degree. And so social media gives us the ability to connect with those in our past that, and to keep up with them where the relationship otherwise might have kind of dropped off. Or, you know, we all know those relationships that got to just Christmas card status, maybe. And social media allows a little bit more interaction or at least a, um, like nonverbal interaction, like an awareness of each other still. Mm-hmm. Then present, right? We're we're able to connect to events and places in our community and what's going on right in front of us in a way that's like very easy to access the information. I essentially no longer look up restaurants on the internet at large. I look up restaurants and their social media pages because I feel like I get more and accurate up-to-date information there than I would for the other algorithms that come with search engines to come up. So there is a benefit to that, and especially with our community in front of us and the neighboring aspects of social media. And then future I think it is a really good way to connect to new relationships. And people have all kinds of different ideas about this. I no longer use the terms real relationships versus internet relationships because I don't, I just don't think that serves us very well. Instead, I've seen a lot of relationships that begin online then transition into relationships that have some kind of in-person component or a and and often these relationships, even when they only exist online, can include some depth that isn't included in some of our quote unquote in-person relationships. And so understanding that relationships just like social media are complicated, knowing that there is a benefit to having new relationships online, that those relationships can hold both the depth and also the weight and challenge of the relationships that we have in person is really going to be helpful for us. But I see a lot of benefits across the board. I don't know if it's my generation, but I just, I tend to see it as generally beneficial with the need for a lot of, and and I think that that is true of many, many places in our life. Generally beneficial, but lots of boundaries are needed. 
Yeah, I think there may be a lot of, of a generational impact to how we view this just because of uh, whether or not you grew up with it when your formative years were. If, if you had formative years with with social media, there can be a lot of, of different ways to view it. It's just it's funny that you mentioned relationships that begin online and then uh, end up in real life. That is how I met my husband online. So <laughs> there are some benefits. I don't think that's very uncommon, right? And you no. probably would have never referred to that relationship as like, real versus unreal. You know, it's the same idea of telling a teenager, like, well, just wait for the real world. Well, I mean, they're living in it. Like, it's maybe different than your world. <laughs> but at the same time, there is a real component to it. Also, if we want for our youth in particular to understand that there is real impact and real consequences to the way we use social media, then we, we have to understand that they are real relationships and refer to them as such. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So, before I get down too many other rabbit holes about my own social media use, how how can social media be beneficial to our, our mental health? I think so often we harp on how it's it's detrimental. And we talked about that last time, too. And there are ways that it, it definitely can, can be dangerous. But how how can it be beneficial? How have we seen it be beneficial over the last few years, too? OK, so I have three touch points on this, too. One is connection, just overall connection, connectivity. We feel incredibly connected in our world. Although, yes, of course, there's lots of isolation that comes in as its neighbor right next to it. I think social media in general can feel extremely connecting, especially for people that are challenged with maybe social anxiety or that are challenged with a physical health issue or disability or whatever. You know, there's a lot of connectivity that comes with social media. Right alongside that comes, I think, a sense of wonder that the world is large. Like this awareness that I can connect to people across the globe. And yes, that is true of the internet in general, opening that door for us. But I think social media does it in a really relational way. Like it is by nature social <laughs> and intended to be for relationships. And so I think that that's a cool component of it is this global awareness that comes with social media and our connectivity to the world is big. And I am just one corner of it. And I think that's a really powerful benefit. Wider lenses, even when it's uncomfortable, is really beneficial for our mental health. The last thing I would say is growth or process orientation. Number one, social media is always changing. And it does, it's just like any kind of technology. It like kind of makes us aware that like we need to learn that we're always having to learn something new is frustrating for us, but it is really good for our mental health. Anytime we have to learn, we're creating like brain volume and, and mass and gray matter. And that's just really good for us. We're creating new connections from different networks in our brain. And that's really, really beneficial for our mental health and has a lot of other like trickle down effects. I think that progress orientation is a benefit that we can actually bring to social media. And so this awareness that I am not the social media I was in 2008 is a meme I just shared actually on my own social media cha channels. There is a temptation to delete all Heidi pre-2018, right? But mm -hmm. the fact that social media shows me my memories, number one, and the fact that social media is always developing and I can see like old versions of myself and the way I would have act interacted when with a certain person, that helps me see that I am a work in progress. You know, it takes a little bit more digging maybe to get to that benefit, but I do think it's really helpful for us to see and be really aware that we are always changing and growing. That's a great point. Yeah, that pop up on social media to me are a great reminder of how when social media was new, especially something like Facebook, when it was new and we didn't quite grasp, or at least I didn't quite grasp the the need for boundaries. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, the example that you were giving last time, Sarah, that there are only certain things that you, you have a pretty narrow list of what you'll <laughs> share on social media, what you'll talk about, post about on social media. And it, when, when some memories pop up from the early years mm -hmm. of my first use of Facebook and think, wow, that's not something I would even post now because I have a pretty narrow list as well, just because of how 
social media has evolved and how little I knew about it then. Mm -hmm. But as you pointed out, Heidi, yeah, it's a, it's a, a nice reflection on, okay, I'm a work in progress. This is something I've learned since then mm -hmm. as, as Facebook has continued to change as have I, <laughs> um, and how I use it and understanding that. Mm -hmm. How does, how does social media, it, you said it, the connection can happen on social media. Mm -hmm. How then does it help us connect? You know, I could think of my own examples, but I, I want to hear how you think it helps us connect. I think that it is definitely a more accessible way to see that other human beings are like living and breathing around us and have similar concerns is one really valuable thing about it. It can be isolating in its own way. And that's for another episode, right? Like we're focusing on the benefits. And so I feel like it's just so easy to bring up the exceptions about how bad social media is when we have these conversations. But if you can sit with me for a minute in the fact that when I open my phone and I see that someone else is also looking for a way to like help their teenager understand a certain concept, there is something incredibly connecting about that. Or when I get into a group and it's a bunch of other Lutheran women, like I'm not the only Lutheran woman on the planet anymore than trying to like, you know, stay faithful in the brokenness of the world and things like that. I think that that is a huge way that they help us connect by seeing shared humanity in both suffering and joy. And that comes with lots of complications in how we interact with mm -hmm. that. But shared humanity is always good for our mental health. Sure. The connection with someone else. So when you realize that I'm not the only one who eats weird stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I'm one of those people that post pictures of food. Oh, yes. And I, you know, enjoy seeing other people's pictures of food. I don't know why. It's fun. It's I post pictures to... of cookies. Yeah. I almost posted a picture of a cookie the other day. I was like, wait, I've already done this like a month ago. I probably don't need to do cookie. it again. It's the same cookie. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. but, uh, Too much, Sarah. <laughs> yeah, some of those unique things that, that can be a, a point of connection for us with others. We're going to continue the conversation with Deaconess Heidi in just a moment here as we talk about the benefits of social media on the Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason, to use your God-given gifts to help others, to live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world, to live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50 plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live uncommon. Welcome back to the Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. We're talking social media today, particularly the benefits of social media. And a reminder of our disclaimer, we're not promoting any particular platform of social media. We're not saying you should use or shouldn't use social media. We're just weighing in on today on the benefits of social media. So we've talked about social media being a, a way to connect with others and how that how that can be a way to connect. Can it can social media connect us to or, or give us a sense of community? I think you both kind of alluded to this with, I think you were talking about essentially Lutheran Ladies Lounge, yeah. you know, and a sense of community. How does social media connect us to a sense of community or maybe forms of support? Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. Well, I think it's most helpful to look at this in the terms of like concentric circles because it's my favorite kind of graphic, evidently. And that is like understanding the kind of support we can get in a one-on-one -on -one relationship, a small group relationship versus like a relationship that's like large, like our entire community or our entire body of Christ or our, the entire world, right? And I think we forget to apply this to social media. And so this is a benefit and a boundary all in one, right? That we're going to get the most sense of community and support when we accurately judge, I think, what content has space in each of those concentric circles. So if I want to be heard and seen by someone um, and get the most feedback, just like in life outside of the internet, that one-on-one -on -one relationship is going to do that most for me. So I'm going to use Messenger or I'm going to use a, a direct message or some way to individually connect to someone, especially for the most vulnerable pieces. I'm not saying 
don't put anything vulnerable in the internet. I'm like the least likely candidate to tell you that. However, be aware of the level of feedback you're going to get and what you need. When we have something extremely vulnerable for ourselves, it's best to start with those smaller circles, one-on-one or a small group. Um, The small group relationship is another way we can connect. And all kinds of social media platforms have ways of creating small groups or having like our favorites is one way in certain social media platforms, we can keep our information to just a select group of people that are closer to us who are more likely to respond. Um, A lot of times also you need to state what you need in the same way you do in a marriage or in a friendship outside of the internet, stating what you need when you're going to share something vulnerable is really helpful. And then that that individual one-on-one or small group is more likely to respond to what you need in the way you need it. Then the last thing is, and I think, unfortunately, we flip these, right? Like we often share a vulnerable thing at large with the Mm -hmm. entire community that is, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. And then we don't get the feedback that we need. Like we get Mm -hmm. someone else's story when we're trying to have someone help connect us to our own. And so being aware that when we share things at large, Sarah's boundaries are actually quite good, I think, for considering, is this something that's less vulnerable to me that is more intended for a large audience? That's good. And then not that you will never share like a prayer request or you wouldn't share something deep and meaningful, but knowing that the feedback is likely to be both broader and also often, this is true, especially in social media, less related to the thing you shared. Like, and I have whole kinds of concepts about that and why that does, social media does that in our lives. But people in a large setting like that are less likely to comment on what you actually said and more likely to comment on what they, what you, what they heard. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's telling that Facebook groups particularly have become such a thing uh, that, that Facebook has has made them a large part of that platform because they understood and uh, came to understand that that interaction in those groups was a huge driving factor of why people uh, were using the platform. Mm-hmm. And and I, me personally, just in my own experience, I've found that to be very true. I mean, we talk about the Lutheran Ladies Lounge, gigantic community of women, but there's a lot of of connection points that we try to to build into that group, like a prayer request thread that we yeah. have every day. People really appreciate being able to share those prayer requests. And then the ladies in the group have that opportunity to pray for these people that they don't even know, probably. But that brings together people from all around the world around a single idea. And also for like chronic illness groups or Lutheran musicians or Lutheran cooks. I mean, there's a group for everything. But it's nice to be able to keep those ideas kind of centralized. And and there's I hate using the word safe space, but there's a there's a deeper understanding of of you go to this group or community because you want to have a certain conversation. And that that's a nice way to to kind of be able to have those boundaries about what you talk about where. Yeah. That makes sense. I think it is helpful to also remember anytime you're sharing ideas, information, thoughts, you know, creativities, judgments. <laughs> You have to be aware of the width of the lens, if you will. So if I'm sharing with one person, it's going to be one person's lens and maybe my lens shared together. If I'm sharing with a few people, I'm going to get a few lenses. When I'm sharing in a wide group, um, I'm going to get a lot of different lenses, which has a huge benefit. Like a lot of times those wide lenses serve me well, but that doesn't mean it's always what I need in that moment or what I'm ready to hear. And so Mm -hmm. being aware that the wider the group, the larger the group, the wider the lenses that you're going to get and, and, you know, proceed accordingly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's dig a little bit more into, into that, that concept of idea sharing. How, how is sharing ideas something that can be beneficial to our mental health? Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. I can get the answer I need for where I should eat, what kind (laughs) of diaper cream I should buy. And how to make kielbasa from scratch in the click of a button, right? Like, and I can get 17 different ideas of how to do it. So I'm not limited to like the one person who wrote a cookbook in 1972. Like instead, again, that that's that very present use of social media that I can not only connect to people in doing that, but I can actually get the answers I need. That said, the drawback is, right? Like not everybody's an expert. (laughs) <laughs> everything. Oh, wait, wait, really? I know, it's like shocking. Everybody thinks they're experts. <laughs> like, like, 
very few of us are actually experts at all on anything other than ourselves. And then some people are experts on a specific topic, but they're not experts on everything. And so being aware, I think holding it lightly is a dialectical behavior concept that comes in really helpful here, where when I post something, when I'm reading ideas and things, it benefits my mental health when I'm kind of just receiving it with like thoughtfulness and a lightness that it's not like doesn't hold all the weight of something that like my mom's advice would for me or something like that. Mm-hmm. Instead, there's a lot of a lot of fun in idea sharing that innovation brings creativity and like lights up all our brain circuits and stuff and gets us going for new ideas and wider vantage points. But hold it lightly, right? Don't let it be something that weighs you down or one person's way of making kielbasa be the way (laughs) because you have the benefit of having multiple different ideas here. So have you successfully learned how to make kielbasa? I haven't actually, I have no idea where that came from. (laughs) (laughs) Do not contact me for the last last piece. That's hilarious. (laughs) For me, I know when I was diagnosed with a pretty severe food allergy a few years ago, how helpful social Mm -hmm. media was to connect me to resources that that helped me make it through that first month or six months or whatever of changing the way that I was eating and and other things that that were impacted by that allergy as well. Um, While still feeling somewhat isolated because of this new allergy, it, it connected me to other people. Now, granted, you, the boundaries that we've talked about w- or are very important to understanding that not everyone who's commenting is an expert. And unfortunately, this was one of those weird, new, rare, like recently discovered allergies that not a lot of people and not a lot of physicians know about as mm. well. So having that social media connection to other people who've experienced it was helpful so that I didn't have to cry every time I went to the grocery store. Oh, I feel I feel that. <laughs> yep, same experience. It, finding one or two things that that other people who have experienced this allergy have found, like one or two treats that they really like that I could you know find at the grocery store and and feel like that was a success mm-hmm. um, because uh, someone else in the group had shared that. That was helpful and still feel connected. Now I'm on the other side of it, a few years of experience with it, and seeing other people who are newly diagnosed with this allergy and trying to from time to time, provide something that's helpful, knowing that I'm not the expert, but if there's something that I can share occasionally, we'll do that. Mm -hmm. So speaking of of sharing, how does the sharing of ideas benefit our mental health? We have just what, like two minutes left. So (laughs) sharing of ideas, how can that be beneficial, especially when we're talking about the social media area? Mm -hmm. I think that winds back around to what you were saying about the community aspect of it. Like that that is really the benefit of having a place for these shared ideas is that that builds community like that may not always have the the conclusion we need or the best answer. You know, we also need to like match that up with some other sources and and also the actual experts in our lives. But the community is really the point of social media. (laughs) And I think that that, especially when we share ideas and we get information from one another and suggestions and things, um, that can also be a, a helpful point for us to see, like, is this serving me in the way I needed to? Is it building community? Or is it making me or someone else feel torn down? Because then that's that's not the point that we need to readjust the lens, I think. So, but th- that amazing amount of creativity that's available and resources and suggestions, um, I think that's really empowering for a lot of people, like you were talking about, especially like with health concerns, with uh, child rearing, with different kind of relational questions and things like that, to be able to have a place to go and be like, huh. I wonder, I wonder what other people have experienced and thought about this. Again, hold that lightly. Hold it lightly. (laughs) Right, right. Let's touch on isolation one more time uh, really quickly. How does all of this idea sharing that we've been talking about, does that help us reduce isolation? Because we've talked about social media as a way that that it can be isolating in itself, but can it also reduce isolation and and loneliness? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the answer is like, yes, it can. It can also backfire on you. And so having an internal radar of like, am I feeling connected or disconnected by this? It's just like a very simple question to ask yourself when you pick up your phone or when you get on your computer and open social media. If you are feeling disconnected, then it's time. 
it's time to turn it off and go do something else and come back or whatever. And it's connection is the goal. So if you're feeling connected, then it's serving its purpose well. Like that doesn't answer all the question, but I do think then we are, um, yeah, like then it is a resource to reduce loneliness and isolation that is really for our benefit. God, the same God who creates medicines and creates so much amazing stuff, like, you know, helped us create the internet. Like he is not absent from this thing either. He knows our needs. Go to him when we, I think, you know, are able to kind of pay attention to that internal sense and let him kind of reveal with his spirit and in his word, like what you need in that moment. And it's okay if sometimes it is social media. It does have benefits. This has been a an interesting chat. I've enjoyed this conversation. It's been helpful learning about the the benefits of social media, looking at social media maybe in a way that I hadn't before. I think it's very easy, as you pointed out earlier, Heidi, to to attach shame and blame to social media because it's easy to just blame technology for everything that's bad and wrong. And so, yeah, it's been helpful mm-hmm. to realize that there can be benefits as well. Oh man, good conversation for Mental Health Monday with Deaconess Heidi Gaiman. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. You've been listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you. Anytime. Anywhere.